your microphone. Welcome back. <laughs> I think we've got folks back. Nancy, you ready to? That's why I couldn't uh, <laughs> see what was going on here. Yes, I'm back. And you can go to the next slide. Um, hang on a second, though, because a few things got a little confused here, and I have to. Uh, what I'm trying to do, oh, OK, there we go. <laughs> um, hmm. OK, so uh, <laughs> we're, we're back again. I, I just want to say one, one thing that this was a fun and interesting session. At the very end, um, pretty much everyone was nodding their head to the issue of whether wh how, how little engagement faculty have with career services. Um, and that may be one of the big topics we want to come back to. Okay, next slide, please. And I seem to have, hang on a second, I seem to have lost my presenter view. So, oh, I wonder, you know what, I think I'm, you know, I'm going to have to hang on a second, folks. Uh, so maybe, Nancy, while you're doing that, maybe we can um, have a couple folks share out from their okay, breakout rooms. I can't find my, oh, there are my slides. Okay, now I'm fine. <laughs> but okay. If you want to do that, that's fine too. Nope, that's all good. Okay, we'll move along. So, okay, so we're going to talk about the big, some big themes, some chapters from uh, teaching students about the world of work. Um, and you might think about these both as a way to think about your own work, because you're all workers, and a way you might share some of these themes with your students. Next slide, please. So um, David Bluestein published an Oxford book um, maybe a year ago called The Importance of Work in an Age of Uncertainty. I think he didn't know what he, what he was uh, foreshadowing. But um, his, that book talks about four assumptions about work. And I think any of these could be a really good subject for a class discussion. So I think that we want to pay a good bit of attention to what he highlights here. So um, work, you know, lots of work does not give people a sense of well-being, but good work does and is important to communities. The second thing is that work is really constrained by, by forces such as uh, social, economic, and political forces. And these are barriers that prevent many people, and particularly low-income people and people of color, from choosing and attaining satisfied and satisfying work. He also recognizes, though, that work competes with other and often imp uh, more important domains. So it isn't the center of everyone's life, although when I do this talk with academics, it often turns out to be uh, more the center than, than anyone really wants to think. Um, and finally, he holds up unpaid work as work as well. So this is kind of a big tent to put this topic in, and one that I think is really uh, helpful for students, because often our students think of work as simply how you get the money to put food on the table. And for many of them, it is, and they need to broaden their vision and their dreams about work. Next slide, please. Next, uh, we're gonna just take a really quick look at this chapter called Work-Related Barriers Experienced by Low-Income People of Color and Indigenous Individuals. Um, this chapter you know, address, addresses inequities the impact of discrimination and racism and those seeking work and the inequitable conditions of those who are already employed and endure very difficult and trying conditions, especially in low wage jobs. So often it's not just the, the, um, <clears throat> the pay that is low, but the disrespect is, uh, it gnaws away at, at, at people's self-esteem and their sense of efficacy. Next slide, please. Um, the, the chapter is a, a, a rich, rich chap chapter. 
but I've just picked out a couple of important things. So they, the chapter makes a distinction between obstacles, which are really bumps in the road to a career, a, a hurdle you can jump over, and institutional barriers that disproportionately affect people of, of color. Um, <clears throat> so the, the obstacles are things that you can develop a strategy to address and you can get over them. The barriers that discriminate and exclude because they're built into our systems and institutions are much more of a challenge. And often they're hidden and indecipherable, which makes them even more destructive than some overt acts that may be in fact very clear. Um, and so um, what I mean here is that often someone doesn't get a, a job and there's this kind of, oh, she doesn't have the right skills or she won't fit in. And those are really uh, stand-ins for racism that is very hard to pinpoint. Um, and there are also barriers in the stereotypes that employers have of particular ethnic or racial groups. They're hard workers, so we don't have to pay them a lot because they'll always work or they don't like to work hard, both very destructive. Next slide, please. So in dealing with, uh, where the, with students, um, it's really a, a, a big challenge because you want to talk about barriers with your students and you want to dif differentiate between external and internal barriers, or at least that's one way to do it. Students often need help identifying barriers and understanding what a term like systemic or structural racism really means. I find people tossing around those terms, but not really stopping to think about what, uh, for example, housing law means to, uh, in, in, from a history of housing law, if any of you've read The, the Color of Law, um, the Rothenberg book about housing policy and how that policy has a cascading effect with people getting evicted, then losing their jobs. And these are all structural issues. Um, so often these words, systemic and structural, leave students feeling helpless to make change. And so they need a clear understanding of barriers. The other huge issue is that students can internalize these barriers as something wrong with them. I didn't get the job because I didn't do a good job on the interview, or I didn't know what to say, rather than I didn't get the job because the hiring manager made a snap judgment based on um, what I looked like or how I sounded. And students use these barriers to self-limit and give up their dreams. And it's something that we really need to help them come to terms with. And it's here where history of, of social movements can be helpful and also where tactics for confronting discrimination with agency and self-advocacy -ad uh, can be discussed and even practiced. And those are some of the, the topics that often come up in ethnographies of work. Next slide, please. So um, this is the tough part. There is a lot of data um, to <laughs> verify and confirm that economic mobility is stalled and it's even more powerful now than it was before the pandemic. Next slide. So you may have seen this. Um, <clears throat> one way to read this slide <clears throat> is that 90% of children born in the 1940s make more money than their, made more money than their parents. On the far right, around half of the children born in the 80s make more, make more than their parents. A point here, though, is that in the 50s and 60s, you could still earn a decent income with a high school degree. Now, even with a college degree, graduates are not assured that they will do better than their parents. And if I just took a little sample of, um, of my friends, uh, we are all helping our kids who are in their 30s or 40s because they don't have um, attraction in the labor market. Next slide. One of the things that I think we've tended to um, underplay is we often talk about income rather than wealth. Um, but when we talk about wealth, we see a different picture. This slide is based on wealth, not income. And the lowest wealth group on the left is about 
40% uh, of the population, the middle is another 40%, and the highest is 20%. By wealth, we mean total assets, in other words, savings account, home, car, uh, etc. Half of all college graduates come from families with more than $190,000 in net wealth, and a fifth from housing, households with wealth of at least half a million. Just think about your own students. This is the group whose college graduation rates have increased most sharply. One more fact, of the bottom two quintiles, so that 40%, 30% do not own a home, and those who do have an average home value of about $64,000. So when we think about wealth, um, we're, we're thinking about a very different kind of asset than income, because income can be okay, but if you have nothing to fall back on, as we discovered to, uh, tragically in the pandemic, you're in a really hard place. Next slide, please. So um, this is a, a, a slide uh, called, this is the term used, the stickiness of wealth. And the way to read this graph is that 44% of children, where the red arrow is, born in the top quintile of parental wealth stay in the top quintile. The term for this kind of analysis is intergenerational transmission of wealth. And the two channels that are uh, by which wealth is trans transmitted are education and inheritance. A lot of this stickiness is caused by inheritance, but Upwardly mobile families who uh, came from poverty um, say having $150,000 income is different from the second or third generation. Um, many of the people who are in the third generation can use their discretionary income to really uh, polish up their kids with all kinds of tutoring. Uh, they live in, in school districts where students get extra support. Um, I come from a second generation family. My parents, actually, yeah. Uh, my parents were able to lend us money for our first house and paid a good chunk of our youngest child's college tuition. And they were the children of immig immigrants. Um, so you can see on the far left that the mobility is, is not anywhere near uh, what we would hope it to be with 30% of those who were started in poverty remaining there. Next slide, please. Finally, uh, for this, uh, if I'm going to go forward with this depressing set of data, degrees do boast, boost income, but the proportional income in lifetime earnings for obtaining a bachelor's degree for those who grew up poor is less than for those who grew up middle class or affluent. And you can see the comparison there. The top line is college graduates, non-low income, and the second line, college graduates, low income. So college graduates from families with incomes above 185% of the, family the federal poverty level earned 136% more over their careers between 25 and 62 than those with just a, a college diploma. So um, let us move on to the next slide and just stop for a moment. This is not the solution. We know far too many people who are working three jobs and still uh, are below the poverty line. Hey, next Nancy. Slide. Yeah. Just real quick. There's a couple of questions in the chat. Okay. I can't um, see the chat, so you'll have I to. I know, I totally get that. To so, translate. <laughs> yeah, so the college graduates at what degree level is a question? Um, for the slide about learning, uh, about earning more, it's bachelor's degree. One of the things that we find in data is people tend to ignore community colleges. They behave, researchers, like they don't exist. And it, uh, my, my husband is the, the, the instant he sees a story in, in the newspaper about, about degrees and the assumption that they're all bachelor's degrees. Um, we have an outcry at the breakfast table, but that's the story. <laughs> and another, another question? I think that sums it up. Okay. Thanks. Great. 
Um, okay, so next slide. Um, so now we're getting to this issue of social capital. And it may seem simple minded, but you have the degree which students want and come to college for. What they don't really come armed with is the understanding of the other piece of this uh, conundrum, which is how important networks, social capital are. Um, and so I would say that this is a very ill-defined area, but I wanna just remind you of what I said at the outset, because I know you've talked about social capital. So the networks and social capital we're gonna be talking about in the next couple of minutes are relate to the labor market, how, the ne how networks are used to open doors to jobs. Next slide, please. One thing I will say also, which has been a topic of conversation at JFF is that since the pandemic, uh, it, with everyone on Zoom, it's made it even more difficult for people to meet each other. And the idea of having Zoom interviews when you've never met the person or don't, and are, were never in a networking situation just makes these challenges greater. So social capital, two definitions here. One is uh, Nan Lin, whose work is uh, sort of central to this whole field. Um, the second is uh, Adler and Kwan, two other researchers. They're somewhat different from each other, but both of them um, deal with this issue of um, <laughs> what it means when you're opposing or putting in the same phrase social and capital. So in other words, <clears throat> the message is that while degrees do raise income and they, they raise the income of the wealthy more and social capital um, is really an economic resource. That's what we're, we're concerned with here. When we pair social and capital, we're talking about actually the economic value of relationships. Um, it, it's also, social capital is also built as in the second um, definition on the kind of goodwill or sociability that people are, are expected to have as they network and build the relationships that can help them. Hey, or, yeah. Sorry, one more question. So we're just wondering if maybe um, before we get too deep into this, if we give folks a chance to talk a little bit about the data a little more, I think there were sure. some thinking about that. So folks, um, are there questions about those sort of previous slides? I got the impression we might have some additional wonderings about those. Just know that there's a lot of information thrown at folks in this context, it can be hard to interrupt, so. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's fine with me. I would rather we didn't get through things. Um, and what's really terrible is I can't see anyone. Right, totally get it. <laughs> So sure. I mean, I uh, Mary should jump in too. She's probably um, more up on the data than, than, than I am. But I started looking at this mobility data probably five years ago. Um, and it's just gotten more refined as things have gotten as inequality has grown. Well, and one thing to think about with the data, uh, this is Mary, I'm sorry, is, um, you know, obviously unpacking it more, but also as we're thinking about our students, um, how we share this data with our students, like what, what are the, the lenses, how do we, how do our students, in, you know, how do we help our students interpret that data, um, and then obviously this data is all uh, pre-COVID. Yeah. Um, so thinking also, um, you know, in collaboration with our students on how um, COVID is impacting in this and, and the data that we're seeing too. But I also think, you know, one of the ways when we talk about careers and the labor market with students is also to kind of how we not only present this with our students, but kind of co-analyze it with them. And um, so I think I'd be also interested um, in maybe, you know, if we talked a couple minutes on, on that, because this is all, you know, the way I view it, certainly is part of career education and, and, um, and thinking on what does the, the, you know, we call it the LMI data, the labor market information data really look like. Yeah, I think that that there's also a ton of labor market information that we use uh, 
a great deal of at JFF. And we really talk about career ladders and, you know, in helping students make choices throughout their college career, they do need to understand that, you know, a, an entry level job can stay an entry level job, but it doesn't have to if they pick the right field. But it's also, I mean, there, there has to be a way to make this, this information less, less depressing. Um, and I think that's about this deliberate discussion about how people network, how, the issues of, of habits, uh, speech, sociability, middle-class sociability, that uh, it's a phrase of Arlie Hochschild's that is expected. Um, and I remember one young man, an African-American young man we interviewed, Mary, who after he'd been off looking at various uh, businesses came back and said, I'm just going to work in a black firm. I'm not going in these places because he didn't, he, he had enough knowledge and agency to feel like this is not a choice I'm going to make. I see that where, how difficult it would be and how comfortable I would be. These are not welcoming places. Yeah, I mean, there's some questions in the chat. I think some important questions um, on the intersections of race um, oh. on, these, on this data, which um, I don't know, Nancy, if, if you have some slides, but I think that's also a way in, um, you know, kind of those intersections around race, uh, race and gender, immigrant status, all of that, how we can, with our students, kind of unpack this data. Yeah. Um, One of the things we do know, and I could refer you to um, Tony Carnevale's work at the Georgetown Center on um, the education and the workforce, is for better or for worse, a lot of students of color pick low income careers like social work and education because they want to give back to their communities. And often they are discouraged uh, because teacher expectations are lower for such students in high school from the tech and science career. So if you look at, how, at the distribution and it's complicated, but you will see an overabundance of people of color in college majoring in these lower wage careers. And you know, you have to think it's a complicated issue to take on. Mm. Could you refer directly to the um, stickness of wealth chart and just the coloring and how that's working with the percentiles? Uh, okay. Let's see if I can go back there. Oh, I can you go back there? Oh, I just you have it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the, these are five quintiles of wealth. So in other words, the the brownish color at the top is the mo are the wealthiest people, and as you can see, that's the biggest bunch of people who stay in the category in which they were born. And then if you move to the far left, the 35% at the bottom are the 35% who um, do not move up at all. This is from, um, there's a demographer whose name is Fabian Pfeffer, and this is work that he does. Um, and it's, it's really about, the title of this slide is how rigid is wealth structure and why? And, it's a fascinating article, which I'm happy to send along to, to Christy, because he looks particularly at <laughs> why the wealthy get wealthier. And I referred briefly to these, the discretionary income that's invested in children, in housing. I mean, there are a whole set of, of issues um, that make wealth sticky. Thank you. So one thing in thinking about the data um, is how presenting it to your students, right? How do we kind of think about it in terms of, and I think that could be like an interesting couple of minutes to sort of think about, um, you know, how, what are, what is, what is this data telling our students, but also what, you know, what are the ways of kind of presenting it and interacting with it with our students? I mean, I think exactly the overlays on the intersections of of uh, socioeconomic class, with race, with gender, 
um, you know, is an important um, way of having students kind of help kind of cope uh, or co-analyze the data with us. Um, but I guess also some other kind of ideas. And I think, um, I think Vicky is um, saying that there might be some level of discomfort. Right, exactly. And I think that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. So how do we kind of, um, you know, kind of talk about that? Um, um, Kate, does Kate have her hand up? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> yep. Um, I, this is maybe more of a comment, but I just so much value your emphasis on the efficacy and agency of the students and the co-creation of the future of our work. Um, and I think if not sharing the data itself, it's very important to share what we know, to yeah. share the concepts and to share. And I teach um, English composition and literature and I, mm -hmm. I'm a, I coordinate a, a series of performance and lecture series. So I'm not a person who, um, anyway, but in, in composition classes um, to bring in some of, of what we are understanding to be these um, factors that create um, a kind of a mystification or a code, you know, there's all this coded language about being successful. Yeah. And I just, I just wanna say thank you. And I'm very excited for this. <laughs> Um, for what you're doing and the emphasis on the students being, you know, coming to our classes with, per with personal authority and with yeah. themselves fully there. And as much as we can value and bring to bear what they're up to already, and then bring some of what I know are sometimes called soft skills or just yeah. navigating navigating yeah. these systems that are, as we know, deeply problematic. You know, I would say one thing, which is what colleges can do well is help students understand and maybe make them angry <laughs> enough to have lots of agency. I mean, and that's really a lot of what we saw from our focus group interviews. I, I, there was one young man who said, he, I, I always just go to work and I keep my head down and I do what I'm supposed to do. But after EOW, he said, it's fascinating. Like when the boss goes out to lunch, the second guy goes and sits in his chair and I see his body language and he starts telling us what to do. I mean, this is, this is empowering. Uh, there's a lot of, of discussion about power, about um, body language. Mary uses a wonderful reading on emotional work which I, you know, it's a, one of my favorite articles. It's about cocktail waitresses who are in Las Vegas who are essentially paid to be sexy and smile. And it, it, it's like an eye opener for, for students. One of them said, now I understand why my mother is so exhausted when she comes home and she watches novellas on her iPad because she's a home health care aide and she is doing emotional work all day. So that's one piece of this. So tell me, Christy, when you wanna move on because I can't see. There are a couple, also some good comments, um, okay, important great. comments well, in the Mary, chat, Nancy. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so um, I think uh, Vicki uh, makes an important comment here, comment, I'm sorry, uh, on the using the data and the importance to change us, um, moving beyond our own comfort le levels to help our students build network, social networks. Um, and, um, and then also Jack is noting, um, navigating systems that are deeply problematic, yeah, building on what, um, what Kate was saying, um, what can we learn and apply to advance efficacy and agency? Um, and I think that that's a really good question yeah. to like swing broad off of. Yeah, um, no, that's a, that's a huge question. And I don't think we have a, a, a good solution to it. Um, but I will say that watching Mary's students and others in that course go out to the 40th floor of a bank when we could do that and have to introduce themselves to somebody at a high level and say, you know, I, I remember remember the, the quote, Mary, from that young woman who said how scared she was. And now I can walk up to anyone and say, hello, I'm Valerie. Who are you? you know? And these we don't we underestimate how little experience many of many of our students are in very tight, very structured communities that are extremely supportive. 
but they don't have, as I'm gonna say in the next slide, many ties to communities that are very different from theirs. And faculty can be really helpful if they're supported in teaching students about these kinds of, of networks. Um, Kate, I think Kate wanted to add, did you have your hand up? Just, I just want to add really quickly that, um, you know, I think community colleges have such a crucial role to play. And yeah. I, I agree that um, with, I'm just delighted about your work and excited to learn more. And I just wanted to add that the other aspect of community colleges is that um, when, we, when we find student leaders, in our classes, we, we can encourage them, mm -hmm. but it's also always so important not to speak for others. And so when we, we might not need to bring exactly the data and analyze that in, in various classes or in, you know, within certain other regions, student development, um, enrollment services, but if we, if we just listen more and say, we understand this is complex, we understand some of this is hard to navigate, but not assume anything about someone's identity politics and not mm -hmm. conflate identity, not guess someone's identity, but rather continue to listen and then educate ourselves more about what critical race theory has told us and what feminist theory and intersectional theory have told us. And it does come back to that somebody within community. It comes back to human dignity, human valuing every single person within these communities and institutions we're navigating. And it's hard because I think we often wanna have an answer and then deliver it in some sort of a binder yeah. or a plan. But it takes a lot of working together across faculty with administrators and staff. And um, when we come back to each of us and what we can share, we don't have to be experts on the data as long as we can help students understand that we're with them. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, said. I think that's an important point. Um, one of the things we do um, also at the beginning of our semester, um, in exactly what you're saying, is our students doing an auto ethnographic um, investigation uh, analysis, right? So uh, in the fall, uh, they do kind of an auto ethnographic. How did I get to college? <laughs> and then in the the spring, after they've had a few semesters. Um, and done their own some research. How do where you know what? Uh, how am I changing? What am I thinking? Like, um, and I think that you know that's certainly central to how I see this uh, career exploration is, you know, students as a co-researcher in essence, right? Um, students as the generator, um, and I think that's really important. So in sharing the data, um, I mean, we can share data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and and JFF, which is, is, is you know important data, definitely. But also, the students are able to share the data they're collecting about careers. Yeah. Um, and I think that's also um, you know kind of an important point um, you know in helping students kind of navigate these systems. Yeah. So, um, so I have one more, just a little bit of a refinement um, about social networks and, and social capital. And then we're gonna move on to this issue somebody already mentioned of, of soft or professional skills. And if we run out of time, then there's the next webinar, which will be <laughs> just fine. So uh, next slide, I don't even know what slide we're on, but this is the one on the strength of weak ties. Uh, let's see here. It looks like we're on a resource valuable in the labor market. Right. Uh, it's slide 23 of mine. Hmm, that is... It's the one just before why are soft skills important. Okay, perfect. Got it. Got it. <laughs> I'll tell you folks, because I, I feel like you're friendly people. The reason I can't see any of you is the only way we could do this is that the presenter notes would show up if I were managing the slides. Not that I'm saying anything you shouldn't see, but you would see all my crib notes as I was going along. So we're, <laughs> we're kind of building this. In the, I'm looking at my own slides and, and, uh, and Christy is managing my slides from uh, Seattle. So anyway, this is actually a concept which I think students do get and that's really interesting. It's this phrase from research that Mark Granovetter, a sociologist 
coined in his work in 1963, when 1973, when he was studying networks, which was the, the strength of weak ties. And up until then, most people who were studying networks and still do actually was how they function in themselves. That's what a lot of network theory is about. But Granovetter was studying how people get jobs. And what he saw was that he needed to understand how networks interact or don't with each other. And he also saw that to get a good job and move up, successful people connected with someone who was a friend of a friend or a colleague and who is generally not someone they know and who was higher up in the social hierarchy. It may not be a pretty picture, but um, if you think about the quote that I had at the very beginning about the well-connected, this is how it works. So he called this, you know, this counterintuitive phrase, the, the strength of weak ties. And there's a lot of literature about the kinds of ties, you know, and many of your students will, of course, have very close ties with family, relatives, people in their community, but probably relatively few ties with people several steps above them, if you I'm saying what I don't like to say in the social hierarchy who can actually help them move um, into a professional level job. So we can move on from here. So uh, one of the reasons that all this social networking and professional skills is so important is because of their growing importance. Next slide. Um, so you've probably all seen this before, but the big green line that's you know, arching way up is the increase in what we call thinking for a living. And very much of the thinking for a living means uh, that many of those jobs, most of those jobs require professional skills. Uh, they aren't the jobs that our young woman was saying, you learn a skill, you do it over and over again, in fact, as you probably have heard uh, ad infinitum, um, those, those jobs are being taken over by robots and the ones that robots can't do are the ones that uh, will remain. So um, that's where we are and that's why it's so important that our students understand whether they accept or not this uh, notion of what professional skills are all about and why um, they are so important to understand. Um, so next slide. And um, at this point, I'm gonna turn this over briefly to Mary, who's written with some colleagues a really fascinating article on the social construction of skills. And um, it's not a, a, a literature person like me, but a, a, an actual sociologist who studies this stuff. Uh, so Mary, do you want to just move on from here for a few minutes? Yeah, can, so we can, um, so I think, yeah, we have a few minutes left in our session. So perhaps, um, as I am a sociologist, so when we talk about what skills do employers need, I, I definitely take a perspective as the skills themselves are socially constructed, right? And they're socially constructed, as we all know, within a system of gender, race, class, etc. So when, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so these are skills, right, that are reported, that employers report, uh, quote unquote, so that they say they want, right? Employers want leadership, teamwork, uh, problem solving, verbal communication, emotional intelligence, strong work ethic, written communication, initiative. Um, so what we thought was, uh, we won't have time for a breakout, but maybe we can just use our, our full group here to kind of talk about these questions. You know, are these skills? How do we know if somebody has them? Who defines them? Who's doing the defining? And how do, do does culture, how does other variables like race, ethnicity, gender impact how they're being defined and also impact how the people are being viewed performing those skills? Um, so I think if we can take maybe kind of, and what I like to do as a sociologist is really unpack this, right? So what is leadership, right? How, what do we see as models of leader, lead, of a leader? What are the, the attributes 
um, are these ascribed or are these achieved, right? Um, so maybe we can kind of take a, take a minute or so to kind of reflect on that um, because- Mary, Mary. Can you yes, explain ma ascribed versus achieved? I kept having, I, I got confused at the beginning about what that means. Well, oh, so I mean, so sociologists use that framework and just very quickly, achieved is a status that you achieve, like you get a college degree, right? You achieved a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, associate's degree, et cetera. Ascribed traits are things that people would argue you're born with, right? Um, now sociologists, you know, question, the, you know, what is the kind of nature versus nurture thing. But in terms of leadership, we often see, we often kind of use the term born leader, right? We've heard that used, but are, is that true? Or is it just perhaps because they're a, you know, white middle-class male, they're kind of seen as a born leader, right? Or seen as leadership as something innate. Um, so, how do we define um, these skills, like what Christy is saying here? Or how do we even define these as skills? Yeah, it's as skills, yeah. Yeah. Are these skills? And, and I think one of the things, you know, when we think about, you know, we can even think about our own work trajectories and sharing this, um, but how, um, you know, our students see this. And also like for leadership, our students are leaders in so many different ways in their communities, in their families, in their colleges, um, you know, and translating that, right? Seeing, you know, valuing that as leadership is important too. Mm -hmm. So I guess folks' reactions, the extrovert versus introvert, that's it. social or cultural capital, yeah. I mean, another way of thinking about it is just looking at this list and saying, are, are these skills that you have perhaps? Yeah. Or you would yeah. define that you have or how you would define them? And you know, another big aha that I had when I was doing this presentation a couple of years ago or something like this was um, a wonderful guy who is a vice president at the Community College of Philadelphia, African-American man, stood up and he said, you know, these are all situated. So a kid can be the one in his neighborhood who organizes the pickup soccer game. And he's the, the, the person who has all the organizational skills and can rally all his peers. But when he gets in a white workplace and has to show that he's a leader and people look at him and don't think that he can be a leader, those skills are not apparent. So that's another piece of, of of the way to look at this. You, you don't have a leadership skill that works in any context in any situation. Right, I, I, I actually agree with that. I think it depends on the, the culture of the organization. Yeah. And um, a lot of those kinds of um, characteristics that are attributed to these skills are kind of hidden, they're secret, they're mm -hmm. not. And, and I would argue that sometimes those organizations don't even know what those skills are. They just know they feel it or they sense it or they see it, but they couldn't, ident they can't identify these are the traits we want. And those, those characteristics uh, um, are probably very much aligned with who they are, right? Because yeah, they're the ones doing um, the hiring or the choosing or the picking. And that's why I call, I actually refer to all these things and these characteristics that we talk about as being soft skills, as hard skills, because you, you, we act like it's soft skills to me implies it's easy to learn. But if, if you're an adult and you don't have whatever the organization or career field that you want to enter and you don't have these, these skills for that industry, um, probably they're going to be, most of them are going to be hard to develop because it's a way of being and existing. Mm. You know, what, what a particular organization or industry views as leadership or teamwork or problem solving is going to look different based on that industry. And so one of the things I think that's important for us to do is to have those conversations with students, not necessarily looking at the data, but talking to them about how, how will you, how will you learn or glean the culture of the institution that you want to work right. in 
yeah. until you get in. Yeah. And then it's, then you can morph that and, and, and kind of nuance it, but getting in the door, it is different than when you've been there a year. Mm. And, and these are not easily quantifiable um, skills. We might have, even in this group, we might have overlapping characteristics we would attribute to all of these, but I bet our lists would also diverge from each other. Yeah, I think that's really no. important points that you're raising. Um, and because of the ambiguity, right, and how we define these and how also those definitions are embedded with um, suppositions around things like gender, race, et cetera, and other forms of, um, we, um, it also becomes, people fall back on kind of what you were saying, like fit, right? So you kind of like know it when you see it, so to speak, right? And that is not quantifiable, um, but it's also a way of being very exclusionary. Um, hmm. And the other thing is that these skills are generally defined by the person higher up in the social hierarchy. Right. So, so yeah. <laughs> um, so we have about five minutes left together. Um, Nancy, Mary, do you wanna give us a sort of last um, closing remarks and then also um, a little preview again of the session two and three. And then if folks, uh, just a, I have a couple of um, housekeeping things at the end as well. I have two things I want to do before we jump off. One is uh, just jump two slides to the cartoon. Okay. <laughs> just so that this confirms a lot of what we're, what we're talking about. <laughs> and then um, I, this, we can send out the slides so we don't need to look at this, but I want to <laughs> just end sort of where I began, which is with this, uh, slide 32, which is the life map. Yeah, let me get, there we go. Okay, because I wanna just put students back into what we're talking about. So the Gates Foundation had this long and really deep project of doing focus groups all around the country with young people. And they had them do these life maps. And if you just take a look at this, starting from the, the right-hand side, Inside the life map are all the things that this young woman wants and outside are all her worries. She's gonna fail in college. You can see she goes along, she wants to have, have a good marriage, but she might marry a bad guy. She wants to have children. She might be infertile. She wants to move up, but there might be a family crisis. You get the drift and there are lots and lots of these and they're all moving and they're different. So work is only one part of her life but uh, we need to always just keep this in mind that we're dealing with whole people. And while we can probably move them to a better place in understanding the work world, we also have to keep in mind that there are all these other things, um, the caring work, for example, that we talked about early on that are extremely important. So I will stop there. And- um, Mary, any last, thank you, Nancy, any last, um words? Um, well, I think, thank you all for, um, you know, the engaged conversations and the breakouts and in the chat. Um, and um, our next session um, in February, uh, we'll be bringing in some faculty, as I said, from Gutman and Bunker Hill in Massachusetts, um, and to share sort of how they um, actualize kind of these larger theories um, in their classes um, and with our, with students. So I would also, you know, feel free. I think Christy, you have, I mean, you can send my email out if there are like, I, I'd be happy to kind of like, if there are questions you want the faculty to kind of touch on ahead of time um, and be prepared for, feel free to email me them um, because I'd love to really um, have a very interactive session um, where we're able to really kind of build on the experiences that we all have had with the courses, but also as you're kind of thinking about the career education. So. Uh, please, Christy, feel free to share my email or I can put it in the chat, whatever is easier. Yeah. And just so you know, the two people from Gutman, one is an anthropologist, Aurora Batista, and the other is an academic dean. And they really have integrated uh, parts of ethnography of work with their um, college-wide outcomes. Yeah. They're, they're not at Gutman, they're at Bunker Hill. Bunker Hill, right. <laughs> Gutman, different, different. <laughs> 
Thank you. <laughs> So also just a, a primer, um, the, the, the part of the session has been recorded. So if you have folks who um, were not able to join us today, but are interested in joining in the second and third, we would really encourage you to do that. Number one, we'd really love to see um, in particular, all kinds of faculty, but particularly arts and sciences, because I think there's a really interesting potential here um, to continue this work um, in the next year. So um, feel free to invite your friends to sessions two and three. There will be a follow-up email. I will be sharing Mary and Nancy's emails um, mm -hmm. as well as the materials. You also um, will be getting um, in the next week um, an e-code. We purchased uh, the book for everyone. Um, so you will have access to that material as well. Um, as soon as our purchasing folks uh, are able to finish that up and they think it will be this week. So um, thank you again to all of you for staying engaged. I know this is um, a less engaging way sometimes for folks to connect with this material, but I think it's exciting um, to think about how we're gonna support students in this lane um, in the coming years. So thank you everyone so much. Have a great rest of your week. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs> See you. So are we staying on or? I think so. If you guys are up for it, I'd love to. Hey, Bob. Yeah, I can stay on for a little. I can stay on for about 20 minutes. I think. I is can that good? stay on for, I might, I might eat, a, eat, eat a, an energy anyway. bar. <laughs> <laughs> so, I just got to let my dogs out real quick. <laughs> No problem. Waiting at my feet here. <laughs> so much. Um, so this went really, really well. I know it's hard for you to see that since you're the presenter, but people loved it. I was getting private texts. So oh, I, know, I know it's not fair to, to have that be the way that that, but it's just the nature of this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They are primed. It made me think, Christy, though, I mean, they are really, you, I mean, you told us this, they're really engaged. Um, and um, I was thinking, I, I, you know, for the next session to really try to be more, less, I mean, I know we have speakers, but less, per, you know, I don't know, like yeah. thinking at that run, let, looking at that run of show and really trying to be, I think, more intentional on, on opportunities for folks. Agreed. Agreed. Um, and even if, I mean, I think this was a primer, but they will be bringing more colleagues. There will be more people at the next session. So we have, I mean, it was inauguration week. I'm amazed any of these sessions have any people in them on some level. So I'm so tired that <laughs> yes, no, totally everyone's exhausted. Right. Yeah. And for us in Washington, we have a really wild ledge session going on. And so the fact that folks are showing up when I'm asking him to do ledge work with me as well. Yes. <laughs> I'm always amazed at how wonderful they are. Yes. Awesome. So, but I just think we need to be prepared for there to be more people. So the large group will not likely be yeah. able to work in the same way as this group yeah. did. So we have to, I think you're right, Mary, really structure it and figure out ways to attend to the structure. And yeah. I apologize, Nancy, early on, I somehow got one slide ahead of you. And so that was the confusion on the slide deck. That was on me. Sorry about that. But no, it's fine. I, I hope they knew, <laughs> was it most of it synced up? Yes. I mean, oh. but it was early on. I just, uh. thankfully someone put it in the chat. They're like, I think the sessions, I'm like, oh no. <laughs> 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 it's okay. Um, they got the general picture. So yep. what I would like to do, I'm happy to have you send out the the deck. It has all my notes in it, but I don't really care. I'll send it out as a PDF. That way they okay. um, don't see your notes. Okay. And the other thing I was going to say, at least in my small breakout, most of those people say, and I believe them, that the faculty have no engagement, that that even though Guided Pathways is about careers, it isn't, there's no support for the faculty to deal with the career part. And that's the big challenge. That's actually college dependent. Oh. I do believe that's college dependent. So I don't know if you were in Penins, which group you were in, but um, 
but that's definitely, man, that's a real continuum of, you know, very involved to not, but what they don't have right now is, in my opinion, from everything I've seen from all the work we're doing together is mm -hmm. a deepened understanding and or investment in understanding how specifically arts and sciences fits into this. And so we have had this long tenured, as a lot of community college systems have, relationship that's, as you both described, CTE and arts and sciences. And arts and sciences for many years did not feel like they wanted a role in thinking yeah. about careers. And so we're still dealing with remnants of that. Yeah. Okay, well, it was, I mean, I could feel the energy. It's a sort of stupid, I mean, I did see the people at the end and I assume they could, I don't know if they could see the thumbnail of me, but I couldn't, it could, yeah. I couldn't see my notes. <laughs> so it's, it was fine. Um, I mean, as you can tell, Mary and I love this work. So uh, it, 